Hi, everyone. Before the episode begins, I just want to remind you to follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Marlene the Plant Lady and YouTube, Everything Gardening with Marlene Simon. And remember, please, please, please rate and review on iTunes and Spotify. That just helps the podcast get a notice by more people and then more people will become better gardeners. And that's what we all want. So enjoy the episode. This episode is brought to you by the Regional Water Authority, which represents water providers serving 2 million people throughout the Sacramento region. With continuing drought throughout California and the West, it is more important than ever to be water smart by reducing the amount you water your lawn while continuing to water your trees. Lawns can take the stress and recover while trees can be lost forever. Trees are a crucial aspect of our healthy environment, providing us shade, habitat for fauna, and of course, oxygen. Be Water Smart wants to ensure our urban forest is around for generations to come. By stressing your water-thirsty lawns and allocating water to your trees, we can ensure this happens. BeWaterSmart.info has helpful tips on watering both mature and young trees. How do you know how much to water? Confused about how much mulch to apply and where it should go? No worries, with their helpful videos and step-by-step -step instructions, you will know exactly how to care for your trees. Did you know that young trees younger than five are at the most risk during the hot summer months? In conjunction with the Sacramento Tree Foundation, you can learn how to correctly water throughout the summer with the bucket method. No more worrying about if you water too little or too much. You can learn tips for efficiently watering trees, the latest landscape watering guidelines, information about rebates, and more at BeWaterSmart.info. That's BeWaterSmart.info. Look at that plant. I want you to know that everything was grown in my garden. Don't touch that plant! Is it poisonous? She'll become part of the plant. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Flower Power Garden Hour. I am your host, Marlene, and today we are going to talk about trees. We all know trees are incredibly important um, for many reasons, and we love our large, old, beautiful specimen trees, uh, special, especially in the Central Valley. We love the shade they give us, but, you know, they give us so much more. So with me is uh, John Lichter. He is a uh, basically a consulting arborist, and I met him because he taught one of my classes at UC Davis way back when I shouldn't give what's that how many years well first of all hi John thanks for joining me <laughs> <laughs> hi Marlene um, pleasure to be here when did you when did you teach at UC Davis I I think I had a Gosh. class from you in 98 or 99 uh you know my memory might be worse than yours so, okay <laughs> uh, i I have taught uh, periodically over the years, and then if I wasn't teaching the whole class, I would just give lectures. So yeah, I'd have to look look back through some okay. some notes to okay. figure that out. Yeah, I just <laughs> I I was just wondering if you were like it was so awful teaching; it's ingrained in my brain that it was these <laughs> number of years. Um, well, I mean that actually shows how much I enjoyed your class because I don't think I could name maybe I could name like two other professors that I had classes Aww. with. So, um, <laughs> but I really enjoyed the class and I especially enjoyed it because you were coming from quote, the real world. Um, you were mm -hmm. actually out in the field, you know, you, your background wasn't just like, and then in the lab, you're going to see this disease. <laughs> and it was actually real world stuff. And, um, for a split second, I actually thought that'd be really cool to be a consulting arborist. And then I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, no, <laughs> we we need more consulting arbors. I know we're, we're just going to say that. So i I want to get into how you uh, sort of dwelled into this, but we're going to start right off the bat because this, there's going to be a little disclaimer. People are going to love your information. They're going to you know be like, "Wow, this guy knows what he's doing." We know there's a lack of consulting arbors, but we'll just put out there: you don't do home consultations anymore. You work for just businesses and government and corporations and large scale, correct? Yeah, that's correct. I did okay. that for about 25 years and I'm, I'm a one man shop. And so I had to let something go. Um, so yeah, I work with, um, you know, design and build professionals, architects, engineers, landscape architects, developers, municipalities, yeah. government agencies, universities, insurance companies, attorneys. 
so, et cetera. So I don't want people to, I don't want you to get mad at me from people contacting you. So <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's take in all the information you give us and then we'll, we'll go from there. But I want to hear about how you sort of got into quote the tree, the tree business. I mean, did you just, you know, as a kid, were you climbing sure. trees, you know, every yeah, day you're, you're like, <laughs> Maybe not every day. I grew up in Honolulu and I was outside all the time. And uh, actually there was a vacant lot where we, where we would climb up into these relatively small trees and um, we'd try to stay up in the canopy of the trees. So we'd climb from tree to tree. Oh my <laughs> they God. weren't that big. The trees weren't that big. It wasn't that dangerous. But um, I was outside a lot and I, I realized that I was interested in, um, you know, the natural sciences and thought, um, I'd either like to study rocks or plants. And <laughs> I went to the University of Colorado and and uh, started out with rocks. And then I transferred to Davis and there wasn't much of a geology program. And I saw plant science and I started down that path and I just got got hooked like you did. <laughs> okay. So I have <laughs> and, to stop uh, you right yeah. there. So my, sure. hu- my husband runs the audio equipment. And uh, he actually went to a PhD program at UC Davis for geology. So he's like, oh, what is he? I was afraid of that. <laughs> I, I, let me let me step back a little and say at the time, I didn't realize there was much of a geology program. He's cracking up. There may have been. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't worry. He dropped out. He dropped out of it. So he doesn't oh, have. Yeah, there you go. So pa- apparently it wasn't that great. <laughs> yeah, but he was giving me a look. And it was like oh, astrobiology. Biology. So, anyways, okay. So, continue. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, it is funny. Oh uh, no, I'm I'm beat red. I'm sorry. Um, sorry. So no, it's all good. Um, so let's see. Um, where was I? So then I I I started studying plant science, and um, very quickly I realized that I wanted to work with trees because you know what do you see everywhere you look look around? I'm looking at about. 20 trees out my window right now. And um, uh, so I quickly realized that that's what I wanted to work with. I worked at the Arboretum um, in the uh, couple of the gardens and then in the nursery and uh, um, just got more and more into trees um, through my studies. And then I worked with a consulting arborist down in the Bay area and that I realized that's really what I wanted to do and did research and extension work um, with the Forest Service and then um, cooperative extension at at UC Davis. And um, there was, the money kept running out and it was all soft money. And so I I thought, well, I guess I'll have to start my own thing. And so slowly but surely I started uh, my own business and that was in 1993. Mm-hmm. and haven't really looked back. Yeah, so it's interesting. We I always say and I heard this from a few other people that people you know people have plant blindness that you see these you know these trees are all around us and I guess unless you're in tune to them a lot of people ignore the trees until they become a problem. Um mm-hmm. so and I always feel like the people who sort of acknowledge the trees early on are the gardeners, the people who work with the, the plants. <laughs> um, but people do, mm-hmm. sadly, I always say trees make the news and when something bad mm-hmm. happens to them. Um, so, okay. So you're, people are probably wondering, well, what the heck does, you know, people know what an arborist does. They see, you know, tree crews out there climbing and, and pruning sometimes not correctly. Won't say anything, but <laughs> <laughs> and cutting or, or removing trees, you know, that probably hopefully do need to be removed. Um, but what does mm-hmm. a consulting arborist do? I mean, on, on your daily basis, what, yeah. what is it that you exactly do? Um, well, so I work as a, a tree expert um, and I specialize in, um, you know, what makes a tree tick, tree management, um, And then preservation. Um, So, um, you know, I I used to to prune trees, but I'm uh, my primary interest was in uh, consulting. So I work with all sorts of different professionals and um, help to develop, uh, say, for example, preservation plans on development projects. So 
you know, how do we, how does the development uh, get built and the trees preserved in, in the process? Um, I do risk assessment of trees to look at what, what the, uh, the level of risk a tree would pose um, to a target, either being a house or, you know, a person walking on the sidewalk or a, or a car. Um, I also do some uh, tree failure investigation. So trees fall and the insurance company or perhaps an attorney wants to know why did that tree fall? Um, I do root damage assessment. So, you know, was it the neighbor's tree that lifted my um, garage or caused or created a crack in the garage or, or was it my own tree or was it, did it have nothing to do with trees? Um, I'm often involved in those types of assessments. I will, um, I will say various those, insurance claims. I will say it was those last two that you just stated why I, I, I turned off from being going, thinking consulting arborists would be good. As soon as you mentioned lawyers, neighbors, uh, <laughs> insurance companies, <Yeah. laughs> I'm like, Oh God. Yeah. There's people involved, <laughs> angry people. I don't want to get into that. Yeah. Um, so it, there are, are some, mm-hmm. So when people are driving by and they see a construction site and there's the orange construction like fencing around, Mm -hmm. say, a beautiful oak tree, you're the one who says, Mm -hmm. no, you can't just put it around the trunk and run your equipment right up next to it. You're the one who decides this is the safety zone around this tree. This is where you can't dump stuff and compact and run your bulldozer over. Yeah, well, um, most uh, municipalities have ordinances that would... um, provide uh, uh, some of those particulars um, where a uh, protection zone should go, how, to, how, to, how one defines um, that protection zone or, or its size, um, and then what, uh, what the, what's needed from an arborist in terms of, um, you know, so that they could approve the development or, or not. Um, so often I'm asked to evaluate the condition of the trees, um, uh, provide um, recommended protection zones. I look at the uh, the development plans and um, often assess, you know, what's the potential impact of building out that project to the um, the trees that are protected by the by the ordinance, municipal ordinance, um, and basically how can we um, modify the designs or or impose treatments that would um, increase the likelihood that trees will thrive, you know, through the, through the development uh, process and beyond. Okay. Do you get a lot of pushback from developers? Like, oh, it's just a tree. (laughs) Um, Yeah. I mean, there's definitely pressure, you know, it's uh, the more, you know, trees require space to be preserved, Mm -hmm. basically undisturbed space. So that is, is generally at odds with, um, uh, um, developers, uh, yeah. engineers who want to kind of maximize, say, parking spaces or houses. Um, uh, so I'm often, and they often call me in kind of at the last minute when, if I was involved earlier in the project, we could be planning for the needs of trees rather than at the last minute. Well, the city says we need to do this and but we've got these plans, you know, yeah, so got it. it can be a little bit contentious at times, but most of the developers are in superintendents I work with are fairly reasonable, but okay. there, there are some exceptions. Okay. They need at least one Oak tree left so they can name the development blue Oaks <laughs> when you're like, well, where's all the blue Oaks? Oh, they cut them all down. I always love <laughs> that. <died>. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there it is. There's the one blue Oak that we named the development. Exactly. After. Um, so, Let's sort of, you know, because a lot of people have questions about trees. They're, oh, I need a water. Uh, which ones are best? Where to plant them? A lot of times mm-hmm. they blame the trees for, th- you know, causing things, which could be, you know, possible. But let's sort of start mm-hmm. back with just placement of trees. Because this is a, you know, mm-hmm. you just mentioned like sidewalks and neighbors. Did my tree cause that? Did my neighbor's tree cause that? So what is a sort of a general rule uh, I, I worked at the Sacramento Tree Foundation in their SMUD mm-hmm. department. 
And, you know, we had guidelines. So oh, look, look at that. Um, where we had to play certain trees. And people were always shocked at how mm -hmm. far, you know, they, because one, a lot of times people's yards aren't even as big as the distance, you know, for a large tree out past your foundation. Mm -hmm. So what are some guidelines that you just recommend for like foundations and, and for a small tree, medium tree, and what is a small tree considered? Sure. Sure. Um, by the way, I was the first community forester with the uh, Sacramento Tree Foundation back in uh, 1990. So wow. anyway, okay. <laughs> I was going back. Um, and, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, weren't you, you a say? founder of Tree Davis as well? Were you founder? Or? Yeah. Yeah, I was. I was on I the was. board. So you just beat me to all these places. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's well, you funny. probably did a better job than I. I but, doubt um, it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, so I think it's so important. Well, not only to select the right tree, but but the right um, planting location to avoid problems in the future. So, as far as uh, providing space for trees um, and to avoid problems in the future, it's difficult to just give one size fits all recommendation, but. <clears throat> excuse me, for a, a large tree, you know, like a valley oak or, um, you know, some other, uh, uh, an elm, um, I would, I would recommend keeping the, or planting the tree at least 15 feet away from sidewalks, foundation, especially, um, you know, curbs, that type of thing. Um, and, you know, considering does my backyard have enough space for the tree imagining the uh mature size of the tree you know i i've been guilty of of you know planting a large tree in you know too small a space myself and um it is hard to think way ahead but um that's important to consider the the spread of the tree above ground and then below ground where are those roots going to go and they tend to be really shallow and wide spreading um so you know depending on the species and the size of the tree um, that will often and the soil conditions um, that will kind of dictate an ideal spacing. But I'd say large trees, 15 feet would be a good spacing, a medium sized tree, say, Oh, um, maybe a Chinese pistache at the largest, you know, probably 10 or 12 feet, ideally. Uh, and more is even better. Um, a small tree, um, like a, a crepe myrtle or something, you might get away with six feet, but maybe eight feet away, um, from those, uh, you know, structures would be, uh, prudent, I think. What, it, what would you say if someone wanted to put one by a swimming pool? Is that like just same mm. 15 feet, no matter what, even if it's a, um, yeah, I, mean, I would consider the, the deck around the pool. So not just the pool okay. itself, but maybe 15 feet away from that deck. And then, you know, if, we, if we're talking about a tree like a uh, fruitless mulberry or a Chinese tallow or something, which has, which typically have very large superficial roots, you know, you might be wanting to either not plant those or, you know, uh, plant those even further away. Um, so. Yeah. And, and speaking of uh, fruitless mulberry, that is sort of on your, uh, your worst, I asked you for worst trees for the area. And, you know, you, you were nice. You said it depends because we never want to poo poo any tree because we like all trees, right. but you know, there is something to be said with fruitless mulberries. They do have more invasive. I mean, they're huge trees for one, um, right. but they tend to have more invasive roots. And I'm just going to say before this, that your website is really has a lot of information and it's tree associates uh dot net and you have a list of like trees that you recommend for the sacramento valley and and then um a lot of other information great articles but some of the trees that you say are the worst for the area you told me like willows leland cypress birch because they're short-lived yes chinese tallow because the invasive roots and large surface roots and fruitless mulberries because of the roots now and that just sort of leads me to no matter if you were to quote deep water these trees they're just genetically uh sort of programmed to have more shallow roots is that correct yeah i mean with with certain species and maybe to step back a little bit i mean i think 
all trees really, you know, even the trees that might, I mean, I hesitated a little bit to say, <laughs> you know, give you a worse trees yes. list because <clears throat> for example, at, at my kids' school uh, years back, um, I recommended planting fruitless mulberry because they had a really poor soil. They had almost no shade there. We needed something to grow fast. Um, you know, so, so I think even those trees that, um, have some negative attributes, you know, they, they can have mm -hmm. their place, but something like a Leland Cypress, they just don't live very long here and they become diseased usually within several years. So that's one I'd probably just say, don't bother planting for sure. The willows, you know, really weak structure. So it's fine if it's out in the back 40 and you don't mind mm -hmm. that it starts breaking apart when it gets larger. Um, but I wouldn't want it you know, hang it over my house. That's for sure. So, um, it's really, um, kind of, uh, looking at the whole picture of what, what, where you're planting, uh, what your goals are for the planting. Um, and then considering the attributes of the tree to see if it matches. So the one list I have on the website, um, it's just, I think it's called trees of the Sacramento Valley and it's not that one's not necessarily trees I recommend, but they're trees that are commonly planted in the Sacramento area. And then I have a list of attributes um, of those trees. So that could be helpful to, um, to look at, you know, does this tree tolerate lawn watering or is it susceptible to various diseases, that type of thing? And what are the, what's the maximum size of the tree? Um, so those are important things to consider. That's true. It is, I guess, a list because I did see the Chinese tallow on there and you said poor in one of the categories. So um, that's good because it allows mm -hmm. people to decide because I personally, I, I agree with the fruitless mulberry. Uh, my last property, you know, I, I wanted shade away from anything. There was no structures. Um, I wanted something mm -hmm. that was going to grow really fast and just give me shade. And it's actually a perfect tree, especially when a bird planted it for you. So you didn't even have to get it established or buy one. Um, so yeah, I guess it's just the, the, the right tree in the right spot, but some, like you said, the Leland mm -hmm. Cypress, they're so short lived. And then the birch trees somewhere <laughs> along the way, people thought, I think they were aspens and thought you had to plant three together. And that's, <laughs> that's what I, that's, I mean, it's yeah. like your experience, you would see like two dying uh, cause they get like what boars and then like one might survive a little mm -hmm. bit longer than the other two. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know where that came from. I think maybe it was a design thing where three looks better than one, but yeah. they would often be planted in the container together. Ooh. So the, the stems are so close to each other that as they get larger, there's a you know, the, the roots can't spread out in all directions. So you'd have a greater likelihood of one or more of those stems or trees to break apart. Um, but yeah, the, um, the birch, I mean, even birch is not a bad selection. If one realizes that the max longevity might be 15 to 25 years at the most, if, and big, if they don't undergo any drought stress at all. And the, you know, the soil's not tilled around them or, you yeah. know, there's no root injury from trenching, that kind of thing. So they're, they're, they're still a place I think for birch, but they are very short lived. Yeah. That, um, relatively speaking. And they don't give a lot of shade. I mean, let's be honest. Well, that's true too. That's <laughs> yeah. true not, too. not that that's what <laughs> we need from our trees, you know, there's other reasons <laughs> to grow them. Okay. So now we sort of have a list of what, what trees people could look at, which ones maybe to avoid the, rough placement of, you know, a large tree versus medium versus small, where to sort of plant, uh, place it. So say you, you plant it, watering is, watering with anything is always, you know, when people send me questions, they're like, how much do I water my tomatoes? And then, or I get a house plant, how much do I water this house plant? And you know, any plant person knows it's like, okay, here's the list of questions I'm going to need to know even before I could start. Of course, you know, soil and sun exposure and, you know, your types of irrigation and, and all that good stuff. So say someone just planted a, a, a 15 gallon tree, which is sort of a standard size. Okay. A lot of trees come in, um, say they planted it in May, you know, so we're getting to, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. not winter with quote, you know, the, in theory, the rains that we get aren't going to be watering it. How would you, how would you go about them telling them how to water it? 
what is how long do you consider it a new tree and how do they know if they're watering it enough? I mean, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, you did you did help me out because the first couple of questions are <laughs> what type of stock, you know, is it a bare root tree, is it a containerized tree, is it an acorn, et cetera? And then when are you planting? Um, May would not be the best time of year to plant a container containerized plant just because you know as you know the weather's heating up mm -hmm. like crazy and um but one thing to consider is when you plant a containerized tree the tree's been in the nursery it's been watered every day you plant it into the ground um the soil that you plant it in is actually sucking out some of the moisture so that the roots are in that root ball they're going to need to be watered regularly to avoid uh the tree undergoing drought stress the first thing that happens when the tree is uh becomes stressed for uh lack of water is it stops growing and that's the absolute worst thing that can happen when you're trying to establish a tree you really want the tree to especially its roots to get out there and you know get into the native soil and and the tree to start start growing because if it's stressed early on in its life um its trajectory for growth will really be, it's hard, it's easy to draw a graph, but um, <laughs> it's going to start out really slowly and its energy reserves are going to be low and you're going to be trying to baby this thing along that, frankly, if if you didn't get it right early on, it might be better just plant a new tree um, and start again. But um, so ideally, if you're planting in a backyard, and you can water the root ball of the tree separately from the surrounding soil. That's ideal because the root ball, you know, starting in May should should be watered probably every day, maybe every two days. And the surrounding soil, you know, assuming a loam soil, you know, kind of a typical soil, um, you know, maybe on the order of once a week. So if I'm watering both, of, if I'm watering the soil and the root ball, you know, every day, that may be keeping it too wet. Um, so ideally, you know, if, uh, it's one tree in someone's backyard, you can build a berm around the root ball and then a berm further out or, or just the berm around the root ball, water that every day, and then water your surrounding soil with your sprinklers or, or with the drip system. Um, uh, it doesn't take that long for the roots to grow out into the native soil if the tree is not is watered appropriately and it doesn't undergo stress. So um, I did some studies with um, with uh, shrubs. There's very little research into uh, how long it takes a tree to get established and how much water is actually required. You know, one of, some of the most basic questions. Um, but from my research, uh, it's probably in the order of several weeks. Um, and then you could kind of transition out of watering that root ball separately um to just watering the soil and and in most soils once a week um is in the ballpark although there's a range um of irrigation frequencies that would work and part of it depends on your soil conditions and you know are you really trying to save water et cetera, et cetera. but but establishing a young tree is not the time to save water even if it's yeah. a really drought tolerant tree yeah, so it sounds like May's not ideal because we're going into the heat mm -hmm. and the plant is trying to get established mm -hmm. at the same time. So obviously early spring or fall would be ideal. And so that's mm -hmm. actually pretty quick that they uh, are able to get their roots out that quick. So it's so it sounds like within mm -hmm. a few weeks, keeping the root ball where all the roots are at and the surrounding soil it then transitions to assume the roots are going out to that surrounding soil. So now you're just going to water the surrounding area and you will, you know, when we say mm -hmm. surrounding area, basically also, uh, you know, close up to the trunk as well. Um, but mm -hmm. I mean, wouldn't you say it's probably a darn good idea to sort of dig down and check into the soil? Cause some people have pretty poorly draining soils. Gosh, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I mean, if you actually are digging down and looking at what your soil is doing between irrigations, you're going to be ahead of nine mm -hmm. out of 10 of your neighbors, I would say. Um, so when you dig that planting hole for the tree, you can actually fill it with water um, like a couple times and then measure the drop in the 
the head of water or the surface of the water. And if you're not getting, if the water's not draining at about an inch per hour, or if it's draining, you know, a quarter of an inch per hour or less, you know, there's something restricting the drainage. And so in that case, you want to determine what that is. Is it a hard pan layer? Is it a change in texture? And that would need to be addressed or you're going to probably have problems with your tree. Um, uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the rest of your question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's, a, no, that's good. I, I, I have a feeling people are going to like reverse that and I'll, I'll let them rewind it instead of making you repeat that about, you know, how to tell if you have good drainage and what to expect. Cause you know, some people, they want definite numbers. It's good to have, you need sort of a baseline. Um, but so mm -hmm. digging mm -hmm. down, you could simply dig down at, you know, a, a newly planted tree, the soil is going to be a little disturbed. You could use a, a, like a, a, just a long, uh, I imagine just a long, a really long screwdriver possibly, I think, um, mm -hmm. or just something to and do almost like a dipstick test. <laughs> Is that? Yeah. Thanks for, yeah, that, I think it's really helpful. So, uh, one question is how long should I water? Mm -hmm. You know, how long should the sprinklers be on or how long should I hold that hose out, uh, to fill the, the basin? And one way to do that is to use, um, a sharpened steel rod, uh, what's called a tile probe, T-I-L-E probe, mm. um, is a, basically a sharpened steel rod with a T-handle. And you can push that down on the soil. You can use a screwdriver, but the problem is with trees, you'd really like to wet the soil down about 18 inches or so. So I don't know too many screwdrivers that are that <laughs> <Yeah>. long. <laughs> but um, so you, you can push it down um, and it will, it'll be easy to push it through moist soil but if you hit a root or a rock that'll it'll stop but usually you can tell <laughs> just by the way that yeah. feels but you can kind of probe around a tree in many locations um and knowing that the sprinklers are on for 45 minutes uh i can only get that probe down six inches well i need to bump up the the length of time that that the sprinklers are running to get a deeper penetration um, and then the other question is, well, when do I irrigate again? I, I gave kind of a very general guideline of, a, a, of once a week, but ideally one would um, monitor down maybe eight or 10 inches. Um, and just so let's say um, you watered and it's six days after the irrigation, you want to see is that soil drying out. You could dig down and just kind of feel the soil, see if there's still some moisture there. If there is, you may be able to you know, extend the, the interval between the irrigations. Um, but uh, if it's, you know, bone dry, well, then you may want to irrigate more frequently. So um, it's going to be highly variable from even one part of your yard to the next, perhaps. Um, so it's hard to give. So the more you can feel the soil and dig, um, uh, the better off, off you're going to be. I do have an article on my website that goes over um, uh, irrigation methods for trees and it's fairly short and uh, will give a lot of information that would kind of supplement what I just said. No, oh, that's perfect. Uh, yeah, because I think people, I don't think people realize how, I mean, so water can percolate pretty fast if you have uh, sandy, sandy soils, but it could take a darn long, a lot of water to get water down if you have a clay or even a sandy loam um, or if you've added mm -hmm. like even peat moss, it's going to be super hydrophobic, which, you know, don't really mm -hmm. do that. But it um, so digging down is important. And yeah, 18 inches because you want the water to go really far down. And it's really hard to say how much to water because soil type is so important and how hot it is, you know, a 90 degree day versus, you know, 110 degree day. Um, mm -hmm. and if it's on a slope, if there's even just a little bit of a slope or so all mm -hmm. that is all that you need to take into consideration, but you want to get the water down deep and is, so it's not a good idea to just use your lawn sprinklers to water. Right. Well, I mean, I think you can achieve that with the lawn sprinklers, but okay. it, again, it depends. That's probably the theme of the show, right? Depends. But yeah. <laughs> um, uh, if the soil, if the soil is really compacted, if, if it's on a steep slope, if it has a lot of clay, then watering the sprinklers, especially if they're putting out the water really rapidly, there may be a lot of runoff, um, and you may not get that kind of penetration. And 
So a drip system or even a soaker hose would, would uh, enable you to get a, a deeper penetration because it's putting it on more slowly and so it's less likely to run off. On the other hand, if it's relatively flat, um, uh, you know, sprinklers could be used to, to water trees effectively. However, um, maybe we're watering in areas that we don't really need to be watering. Um, and, you know, if we want to preserve, uh, preserve water these days, um, mm. you know, there may be a more effective and, and efficient way to water, water mm. the trees and sprinklers. Yeah. I just always put a hose by my newly planted trees, you know, and then just let it, let it on a very slow drip with the berm. Um, uh-huh. and you know, they got established pretty, yeah. I mean, it was paying the butt dragging a hose. I hate <laughs> hoses. Hoses are my, uh, it's my nemesis. Uh, okay. So say, <laughs> say you move into a house and there's a mature tree. Um, and, and mm-hmm. you know, a lot of people do, they move into a tree in their house and they're like, wow, I absolutely love this tree. Does it mm-hmm. need water? You know, say you're in a neighborhood and with a standard size yard, or even say you're out in the, you know, the country and there's a large tree. Uh, do you need mm-hmm. to water established trees? Is it good to water established <clears throat> trees every once in a while? And how do you know? And I know, um, you know, want to talk about something like the drip line, because I think that's been ingrained in people's head that that's where magically all the roots stop, right? All of mm-hmm. a sudden you get past mm-hmm. the root line and there's no roots. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> so the, um, in most cases, I would say irrigating a mature tree is is a really good idea. They don't nece- they won't necessarily need water, you know, real frequently necessarily, but um, it's going to depend on the species of tree and its drought tolerance. Um, is it getting, you know, where is it getting water? Maybe, maybe it's getting water from the neighbors. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, most trees would benefit from irrigation. Um, a really drought tolerant tree in a decent soil you know you might be able to get by with an irrigation once a month but it's got to be a really it's got to be spread out uh under i would say under and beyond the canopy but uniformly in that area not just at the edge of the branches um and then on long enough to wet the soil down 18 inches ideally so um uh yeah there's nothing magical about the drip line or quote the feeder roots being at the edge of the canopy. Um, there are small roots from the base of the trunk out well beyond the branches. Uh, if there's no impediment to root growth, um, out there, but, and, you know, there are few studies looking at, uh, the extent of, of root growth in urban trees, but, um, they often extend well beyond the branches, sometimes two, three, four times the distance from, the trunk to the edge of the branches, there'll be small roots from, um, from, from the tree. And I'm sure you've experienced that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Any gardeners experience that. Yeah. It, it, it's the fun game of where did this root come from? Well, look at all the trees <laughs> around. Some are, you know, very distinct, but others you're like, is that from there? And, and I like how you mentioned <laughs> drought tolerant because, you know, people do plant redwood trees in the central Valley. Mm-hmm. And they are not drought mm-hmm. tolerant and they're going to look really sad. And, and it's not to, you know, we have such a severe drought. We're coming to severe drought. I don't like to see any trees die, but it's a balance of how mm-hmm. little you could water them before the tree is so stressed. Mm-hmm. You might as well just pull it out. Um, so they're, so yeah. I, I like your idea of, it sounds almost like if you just put a, a hose with a sprinkler, move it around keep it going a really long time, wet the hole underneath past the drip line and you want to soak it. So it's eight wet, 18 inches down and do that about once a month during the summertime or, you know, spring going out of the heat. Um, and it sounds like most likely most drought tolerant mature trees, that's the way to water. So I think. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just add to that. Mm-hmm. So the, uh, that would be kind of the minimum, I would okay. say, for a drought tolerant tree. Doesn't okay. mean that it couldn't survive with less. Mm-hmm. But the question is, well, how? You know, it's it's taking a risk to to water less and less and less. Is the tree gonna gonna tolerate it? And it's very difficult to say, even for an expert. You know, how much water does that that particular tree need? Um, but I would say on an 
ideal basis, even a drought tolerant tree watering twice a month would be better. But, you know, we are in uh, strange times in terms of um, uh, drought. Um, and then for a, a non drought tolerant tree, um, like a redwood, I, you know, they're going to need watering more than more than once a month for sure. So you could probably get by. Um, and again, this depends on assuming good quality soil and and a large area, um, but you could probably get by watering them every every other week um, as well. So, and I'm just going to throw this out there. I think I know the answer, and, and sorry if I am c- calling you out on this, but I mean, I've never no fer- I've never fertilized established trees. I never fertilized new trees if they're going in native soil. I've added maybe compost around the top of new trees to act sort of as a a mulch and then that's worked its way mm-hmm. in. Um, I've added wood chips also as a as a mulch to just retain moisture on new trees, but I've never fertilized. Mm-hmm. Do you I mean do they need to be fertilized? Yeah. Um well it depends. Okay. okay. <laughs> um yeah how, you could have a drinking game. How yeah. many times do I say depends? Oh um, I am I am I'm uh, on my yeah. I'm on my <laughs> yeah. <Perfect. Just> kidding. <laughs> um but uh, um, I guess if oh it's in de- now, I, now I just sorry sorry. Um, I guess if it's in decline, because the first thing people like to do is when <laughs> something goes awry with any plant is oh let me go ahead and well usually it's let me water it. You know sometimes right, overwatering right. it, and then then the next thing is right. is I fertilized it or I want to yeah. fertilize it. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah yeah, mm-hmm. so there there are. Um, certain cases where fertilization is important, um, not typically in the central Valley, but there are maybe cases where, um, let's say you wanted to plant, and this would be not advisable, but if you wanted to plant a tree that really required more acidic soil conditions, Mm -hmm. um, you know, let's say a red maple or something, um, or a pin oak, um, in Davis, then, yeah, you may need to put down some soil sulfur or some iron chelate. Um, but in most cases, if it's a well-adapted tree to the site, um, you really don't don't need to fertilize. Nitrogen can push growth, but there can be some ne- negative consequences of that. Um, but uh, generally, I don't fertilize trees um, okay. that I plant myself. Okay. All right. If you don't do it, then that's the answer. I mean, right. (laughs) No, there's always, yeah, there's always, and like you said, it also depends if you're in an area with really high rainfall in sandy soils, the nutrients are going to be leached out faster. Mm -hmm. We just happen to have, you know, clay soils or sandy loams if, if you're lucky and those tend to have more nutrients in them. So, Mm -hmm. um, but I just knew people were going to be like, well, what about fertilizer? What about fertilizer? And I tend to actually forget Mm -hmm. to even bring that up because I just don't fertilize a lot of anything. Um, right. But, but what you said about using a mulch, I mean, that's, that can have tremendous benefit mm-hmm. for trees, um, uh, you know, in controlling, uh, weed growth, moderating soil temperatures, reducing evaporation, um, and also just kind of protecting that upper surface of the soil from, um, the rain that can kind of cause the crust on the surface of the soil sometimes. So I'd highly recommend uh, wood chip mulch, um, you know, coarse wood chip mulch, maybe four inches thick under and beyond the canopy if you can, um, and keep that lawn away from the base of the trees if you can. There, there's studies that show tremendous uh, increase in growth just by keeping the lawn, you know, just a couple of feet away from the trunk when the tree's establishing. Um, wow. So, Do you think that's, is that... To, is that from moisture? Or is that the laleopathic like chemicals they emit? Do you know? Yeah, I think it's uh, from competition, you know, for resources, and then um, I believe there is some allelopathic effects. But I this is going way back. I don't. <laughs> no. I, I, don't quote me on that's, that one. <laughs> that's fine. I just, you yeah. know, I know like, you know, some grasses, if they're annuals, I think they have more. But yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, grasses. And another big reason to keep grass away is the weed eater hitting mm-hmm. the trunk of your tree. That, <laughs> that damage doesn't 
And that's always, a, I'm sure you get, get this question too. It's like when someone sends me a picture and it's like, you know, say a tree is seven years old and it has some, you know, a nice chunk taken out of the base. It's always like, oh God, you know, my gut wants to say it might be okay, but mm-hmm. you know, so I'm glad they're not, they're not paying me. And I could just say, eh, I don't know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Cause you yeah, don't know. I mean, That's the problem. Sometimes you just don't know. <laughs> especially from a photo. Um, yeah. It'll, it'll really depend on what percentage of the circumference of the trunk has been uh, damaged. And mm-hmm. if that damage goes down into the wood or if it's, you know, hasn't gotten, you know, beneath the inner bark. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, if, if we're talking about 20% of the circumference, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Whereas if we're looking at 50% of the circumference is, um, uh, the weed eater has actually taken all the bark off, then yeah. it, it's probably best to just start over again. And to that point, if you have trees that have been in the ground for five years and they really haven't grown much, and mm-hmm. uh, there may be, I used to try to save in quotes these trees um, for clients. And, you know, over the years, I, I realized that, you know, they would have been better off instead of, yeah, we can correct certain things like irrigation frequency and we can amend the soil. But frankly, they would be better off um, starting over again with a vigorously growing tree, providing ideal conditions to start in terms of, you know, breaking up the soil, creating a good planting hole, and then irrigating appropriately. Those newly planted vigorous trees will far outgrow the ones that were languishing um, that we've grown attached to. Yeah, no, I know that that's it. Especially, I'm sure you see this too. This is, I've told Joe, never plant a tree if I die, because the stress people are under to keep a memorial tree alive. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean, I don't want to joke about it, but it's like, Oh, Mm -hmm. you know, people, it's sort of like when people, I said, don't, don't give people, um, planted plants at a funeral, give them flowers Mm because you expect flowers to die. Mm -hmm. You know, people send me like, they're stressed out. They're like, Oh, I'm killing this plant. And it was from my mom's funeral. (laughs) And, you Mm -hmm. know, I, I'm sort of joking just because I'm a, I have dark, sick humor, but it's, it's true. (laughs) So, you know, so those trees, yes, you man, you're like, oh my gosh, I got to keep this plant alive for this person. But yeah, if you notice a tree's not growing, you know, sometimes when a plant is small, like a citrus, I'll say, just rip it out of the ground, uh, dig it out Mm -hmm. uh, and see what the roots are like. Cause almost always you're going to have like circling roots or rotted roots or poor drainage or something's going on down there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, not uncommon. Um, yeah, uh, I forgot what I was going to ask before, but okay. So what are some things that people should never do to a tree Mm. besides carve their initials Um, in, into it? (laughs) Right. Right. (laughs) Well, I mean, I would say watering, uh, you know, every day would be, uh, or a couple of times a day, you know, that, uh, so trying to establish, um, plantings under the tree in the middle of the summer where you really do need to water incredibly frequently, maybe twice a day, that would definitely be a no, no. Um, is that, that will provide ideal conditions for various fungi that can, uh, kill a tree. Um, um, you know, having a, uh, somebody who doesn't know what they're doing, uh, cut the tree i was gonna say prune but um yeah. somebody who doesn't know what they're doing can really do a lot of damage to the structure of a tree if they're pruning indiscriminately perhaps topping the tree just cutting it at an indiscriminate height um or say stripping out all the branches from the center of the tree um you know that can just lead to problems that you really can't correct or uh, or it can be take many prunings from somebody who really knows what they're doing to try to, uh, you know, mitigate those problems. So, um, you know, uh, yeah. So, yeah, you mentioned top. Those are a couple things. Yeah. Cause when people are like, well, I don't want my tree to get, and you know, fruit trees, that's a different story. You could chop fruit trees because you're going to be pruning them and you want to keep them to a certain size. But if you're growing a tree to its full potential, you don't, you know, and it's sometimes these, these trees, or like I say the joke, they're like teenagers. They go through like a gangly phase where you're just like, is this thing mm-hmm. ever going to look nice? And you want to be very careful <laughs> pruning them because 
you, you know, your lowest scaffolding, which is your main branch, you don't quite know where it's at yet. If it's, you mm-hmm. know, if it's really, I mean, really sorry. I mean, how you don't recommend anyone really doing any major pruning, just things that are crossing or root stocks coming up. But when, you know, I, I tell people like three years, that's when you might start doing more pruning than just like, oh, I'm removing this here and there. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think I wouldn't prune. Well, it depends. I mean, if you've got a really real major problem, um, like two trunks that are like right next to each other, mm-hmm. I might prune off one of those at planting. Um, and, you know, removing dead or broken branches. Sure. Um, but uh, I would do it sparingly uh, when the trees are young because you are removing energy basically for that um, will help the tree to grow. Um, But, uh, and then um, there are a number of good um, guides for pruning young trees. Of course, I don't really have a good link or anything for you right here, but we can, I'll put um, one in the show notes after there we go. You could send me one. And yeah, I know I sort of just, I realize I'm like, Oh, I'm opening a can of worms. This is like when you're you're virtual (laughs) pruning, when people, you know, sitting there like, how do we virtual prune? But I just want people to be aware. Don't top your tree, expect it to look a little gangly. Like you said, remove the Mm -hmm. dead. If it's a double leader suckers, but you're not trying to shape your tree from the get-go because that's you don't even know where that lowest branch is going to be yet um let it get sure. established and then just slowly um and mm-hmm. a few other things that i guess are no-nos um you know you you still see it at the nurseries the the wound seal the pruning seal what's the word on the street mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. wound seal i tell people <laughs> no if you do it right it's going to heal itself my neighbor, my neighbor just did that. Um, yeah, it, it, it really provides no, I didn't talk to him. It really provides no, no benefit. And there's some, uh, people that theorize it could actually, uh, increase the likelihood of decay because it's, uh, providing a film, the, the, the pain itself, and then it may be keeping the wood more moist, but I don't know whether or not that's true. Uh, there really haven't been good studies there, but, um, it's really, uh, unnecessary. I don't know personally that it's harmful, um, but it's really not not necessary. Okay. And even if it's a, a wound, you just try to clean the wound up as best as possible and allow it to try to heal if po- right? I mean, there's no like magic. Yeah. No, there isn't. But I would be careful with cleaning it up depending on what you mean. Like, so um, I wouldn't try to smooth out the edges necessarily if there's broken um if the bark is like peeling off you can kind of take it Mm -hmm. back to where it starts peeling if you will or if there's wood in the center of the um the wound that's like kind of splintering out it's real hard to describe you could (laughs) just cut that off but i would basically leave it leave it alone okay um yeah or have a competent arborist take a look and um, you know, give you advice, um, ab- about what to, you know, how to treat that wound if, and maybe nothing's even required. Okay. And then the last thing, um, not the last thing, don't worry. I still have a lot more <laughs> questions. Uh, the last <laughs> thing that's a no, no though. Um, I think it's a little, and I think once again, it might come down to the, the tree, um, somewhat, um, the root cutting let's say you're trenching say mm. you're building a a wall and you encounter a root is there an i mean this is i, I don't want to put you on the spot and you know liability wise <laughs> that's the thing with trees when people send me questions <laughs> i always have to respond with get an arborist get a certified arbor you know get someone who's going to take a look at the tree because you know we do hear about trees falling um so what would they be the the size of like no no just do not cut that root size or if you go beyond a certain size how many roots of that size can you cut you know Mm -hmm. uh get your get your drinks ready okay (laughs) um so sorry um yeah i think one thing to consider to to step back a little bit is does the wall need to go there or does the does the um the drain need to go there or the electrical line can we route it around uh further from the tree so 
you know, if we're talking about we're out at the edge of the branches of a uniform, a canopy that's uniform, okay, no, no big deal. But if we're getting really close to the tree, say within 10 or 15 feet uh, from the trunk of a, a large mature tree, um, you know, then I, I really think it'd be important to have an arborist come in and um, ad advise you about, you know, what to do. But if, um, you know, roots that are, say, an inch or less in diameter, um, I wouldn't be too concerned about. But as far as, and even up to two inches for the structure of the tree, you know, typically if you're not cutting roots bigger than two inches in diameter, you, you for a mature tree, you're probably not going to jeopardize the structure of the tree. On the other hand, you may be um, cutting off uh, roots. Uh, you may be um, causing uh, drought stress um, from the removal of those those small roots and kind of the uh, zone of soil where those roots were uptaking water. Um, if we're getting really close, um, let's say within, um, I might use a, a, a distance <laughs> equal to five times the trunk diameter. So let's okay. say it's a two, two foot diameter tree, that would be 10 feet away. Um, that's where I, I'm starting to get nervous about the, the stability of the tree. Um, you know, for getting closer and closer. Um, so I'd say, you know, if you're out near the edge of the branches of a mature tree, maybe you're just a few feet in, don't worry about it that much. Um, but there's lots of other considerations for um, how to pr protect that tree. If you are uh, building something near the tree, um, I think it's, and it's all in prevention rather than, oops, we drove over the, this part of the tree and we disturb the soil here well, most of the time you can't really can't really fix that on mm -hmm. a mature tree you know if roots are lost you can't put them back if the soil is compacted it's difficult to loosen it um, and not damage you know more roots that type of thing so planning is um, really important um, and to look at all the all the different ways that um, uh, one could uh, install something um, and stay as far away from the tree as possible or do it in such a fashion let's say it's a, a pathway or let's say it's a, a you want to put some decking around a tree well instead of putting a um, concrete deck around around the tree you know patio um, maybe a raised deck that's on piers and those piers could be situated uh, between major roots, um, mm -hmm. so that, uh, you're not cutting, cutting a lot of roots and compacting the soil. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. But, examples. Yeah. But I, I know it depends on, but yeah, I just don't want people, you know, cause there's people who are like, they cut any root and they're like, Oh my God, I just killed my tree. And then there's other people who mm -hmm. are like, Oh, I'm cutting this giant root a foot from, <laughs> um, you know, they're not probably not going to call an arborist anyways beforehand, but it is always a good idea mm -hmm. to get someone out there. Cause, and also you don't know the stability of the tree going in already. You know, if it, mm -hmm. it's, if it's mm -hmm. soil super wet or that tree's not healthy and you start cutting roots, we're assuming the tree, you know, I gave you the idea, you know, the tree is healthy. So you never know. Right. Right. Oh, and, and one other thing on that on that front, I, I have gotten involved in a lot of disputes between neighbors. Um, Ooh, so be really careful if you're going to be putting a, um, a, a digging a trench for a utility uh, next to your fence or putting in a patio or something. Uh, oftentimes the neighbor's trees are not too far from the fence. Their roots don't stop at the property line. Mm -hmm. um, if you're cutting large roots for that, or, or it's probably not you, maybe it's a contractor you hire, you're off at work, you come back and then you see all these, mm -hmm. you know, big cut roots, or maybe the tree falls over a month later, uh, you may be in some hot water. So um, really important to, to understand that roots, uh, it, they're fairly shallow and they extend well beyond the branches. So best to kind of um, get some advice from an arborist and, <clears throat> and work with the contractor uh, and the neighbor, you know, to, mm -hmm. to make sure that the, uh, the trees being preserved, particularly below ground. No, that's a really good, yeah. I mean, that's a good idea. People, you know, someone comes in your backyard, they don't see the tree in your backyard and they think mm -hmm. everything's good. Um, so, mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so let's get into, um, I don't want to keep you much longer. You have a lot of good trees to look at, but, and, and this one, there's going to be a lot of depends on this one, but, um, tree decline. So I'll just give sort of my opinion. What I see is usually when I get pictures, people send to me of a tree from my point of view, it's very rarely something that could be fixed. Usually when they send me something, I'm like, mm, well, that tree has something and I can never ID it, of course, because you mentioned pathogens and unless you're going to culture them or you are, you know, it's fire mm -hmm. blight or something that's really obvious to see. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's really hard. So you sort of look at the symptoms, but people always want a quick fix. And as far as mm -hmm. I know, there's not a lot of quick fix or any fixes for a lot of these fungal diseases. Um, so, you know, when people are sending me pictures of all of a sudden a healthy tree just starts defoliating. Okay. You know, obviously did it go mm -hmm. through, did it get herbicide sprayed on it or did it get, go through a massive drought or something? Um, what are some signs that a tree is sick in decline? Mm -hmm. And is there yeah. anything that could be done? I mean, realistically. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I'm with you. I used to run a master gardener program back in the 90s. And um, I, you know, the, the master gardeners were answering people's tree questions over the phone. And I was kind of cautioning them to, you know, you haven't even seen the tree, you know, even with pictures, you yeah. really, you're only seeing one side. Mm -hmm. and, and even with that, I mean, you know, do you really know what's going on? I mean, even as an expert, um, I, I hesitate to... Um, to comment, I'm just really careful when yes. I say, yeah. <laughs> because I, there's so much I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, I think the things to look for certainly wilting um, in the middle of the of the you know summer would be a, a concern, or the limbs dying back. Um, perhaps the leaves are really small. Maybe you're seeing um, some exudate or fluxing. We call it um, uh, a sap flow on the base of the trunk. Um, uh, if you see any cracking between trunks, that's that's more of a structural issue, but something to kind mm -hmm. of be aware of. Um, uh, what else? Yellow foliage. Um, um, Mushrooms are like, that, and fungus growth uh, yeah. is a huge one. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so yeah, if you see mushrooms in the lawn, they may just be, um, you know, associated with the lawn or some some already dead roots. But then, why are the roots dead? You know, <laughs> the question mark. Yeah. And then if you're seeing uh, a, a shelf fungus or a conch, c o n k, at the base of the trunk, um, that that would definitely be a red flag that uh, there's decay in the trunk of the tree. The question is how much, um, not all conks are, are a problem, but, um, but, uh, if you see that on the base of the trunk, I definitely recommend the tree be looked at. Um, um, there are some fairly sophisticated ways to look at, um, the extent of decay. Um, there are some arborists that would say, well, there's a conch at the base of the tree, the tree's decay, the tree's got to go, but, um, we don't know how extensive extensively decayed the tree is I, I have a a tool that uses sound waves to actually image the trunk and kind of like an MRI if you will Ooh. or a, a fancy drill that plots the resistance to penetration and mm. to the spin of the drill so um, I was just working on a report this morning but um, yeah so there are ways to kind of quantify that and then and then uh, from that with evidence give an opinion as far as the like of the tree will fall. But, um, you know, the, unfortunately to do that costs a fair amount of money. Um, cause it takes a lot of time, mm -hmm. uh, for experts to do that with sophisticated tools. So yeah. It's, um, yeah. Cause most arborists pluses and minuses, you know, and, and, and I get the question a lot of, you know, cause then I, as soon as someone sends me a tree question and I see that there's, you know, dieback or there's fungus, um, even if there's a, any, a conch, I always tell them that could be, you know, decay and it, and it, it could be a matter of, you know, months or it could be years before that tree. And I always say, get an arborist out. And then I'm always cringing. Cause I'm like, they're mm -hmm. going to ask for an ar name of an arborist. They're going to ask. And I don't give mm -hmm. out names of arborists one, because 
I, you know, most of them that I knew well, well, I mean, you know, you, but you don't do home stuff. Um, others have retired. Um, mm-hmm. and two, I just don't want to put, you know, my name associated with, you know, someone goes out and doesn't give correct information or something. And so I'm mm-hmm. assuming most arborists aren't going to, like you said, aren't going to have this equipment and are probably going to err on the side of this tree has decay, uh, needs to come out mm-hmm. or they're going to want to inject it with fungicide. And does that ever mm-hmm. work? Mm, for decay? No, okay. not at all. But yeah. I, I, so to your points, um, it, it's true, uh, and I, I think I've, I was talking to you about this before. I'm, I'm amazed there aren't more uh, consulting arborists out there and people that are interested in what what makes trees tick, so that have studied arboriculture mm-hmm. um, and that are are um, taking an analytical approach to, um, you know, what does that conch mean? It, has the the structure been compromised? What kind of risk does it actually pose? Um, uh, and there are a lot of, you know, so you, if you're going to hire an arborist, you definitely want to look for at, at least somebody who's certified by the International Society of Arboriculture. Um, so an ISA certified arborist. Um, that, that would indicate that, that the arborist has some basic knowledge of trees um, and has some uh, some continuing education requirement. Um, uh, the next step up from that, there are hardly any arborists in the area that have that, but you could look for a registered consulting arborist. That's through the American Society of Consulting Arborists. Uh, I only know of a handful in the area, Mm -hmm. um, but you're right. There aren't that many top-notch consulting arborists in the area, and I'm sad about that because like I said before, I, it, I mean, what's everywhere you look, how important are those trees, you know? And yeah. um, I just haven't seen people um, that have studied and have the experience to really help others manage the trees most effectively. I know people are out there, but. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, it, and, and I mean, it could be also too, if they go into it, they would quickly go into the non homeowners just because it, you know, it could be a lot of time put into one tree for a homeowner versus going and working with a company or a government entity where you have, you know, a big project mm-hmm. or something where it's going to be uh, uh, less personal, less maybe drama. Because, <laughs> yeah. like you're saying, na- <laughs> right, neighbor, right. neighbors and trees and, <laughs> oh, I mean, there's a reason why my closest yeah. neighbor is a half mile away. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Uh, <yeah. laughs> because if I saw him painting wound seal, that would be a problem. <laughs> you know, if I looked out my window and I'm like, <laughs> Uh, what are you doing? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I just wanted to cover some of those that, you know, it's, it's, I guess a sudden change on your tree is never good and it's never going to be, and it's never going to be a quick fix with a fertilizer. It could be a pest, but you're going to probably see evidence of that. Um, and you could just wait Mm -hmm. that out for the most part. Um, if you know it's, you know, your neighbor didn't purposely spray, you know, a roundup and then it drifted. But even then a mature tree, it's barely going to be hit by that. So yeah, any changes mm-hmm. quick, it's going to be bad. And I mean, from my experience, it's almost always things that a tree can't recover from. And it's just a matter of mm-hmm. if it's going to be quick or it's going to be slow and the stability of the tree, which you won't know, like you said, unless you get someone out there to take a look at it. So, yeah, and I think by the time uh, most uh, people that don't know that much about trees have, you know, recognize that there's a problem, it's often just too late. Mm-hmm. Um, so there, there are subtle uh, cues that arborists will be looking for, um, but oftentimes, you know, by the time somebody call me out, say I'm, I'm concerned about my tree. I'm, uh, I would go out to a homeowner's property. And I'm like, yeah, I'm really sorry, but <laughs> there's yeah. not much we can do at this yeah. point. But um, yeah. Um, so I mean, being, you know, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say when, when there are limb diebacks, I tell people if you could get to that limb carefully, 
you know, I don't want, you know, sometimes it's older people who follow me and I'm like, don't go up there. Don't, don't climb the tree on your own mm-hmm. with the chainsaw. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I always tell people mm-hmm. we'll cut the branch back because it could be maybe just boars, you know, look for boars. It could be boars entering just that branch. Or if it is some weird isolated mm-hmm. pathogen, to that branch or something, you might be able to stop it. But that's about the extent of what I say they're probably going to be able to control um, and Mm -hmm. something they Mm -hmm. can do. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that the pruning would help with the borers, but if it is a disease that causes a lesion or what we call a canker, Mm -hmm. um, removing the disease would can stem the spread of it and reduce the amount of inoculum. So for example, with coast redwood, there's a disease called redwood canker and um, removing disease limbs, um, especially, well, can, can if, especially if it's done early when not much of the tree is uh, affected um, and then providing ideal conditions so that it isn't under drought stress um, can uh, you know, turn the help to turn the tree around, but okay. gosh, you know, it, it, it is hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard because there's so many things to mm-hmm. consider mm-hmm. and, yeah. uh, subtle differences, you know, what, what caused that dieback? It could be a number of different things. It, yeah. Yeah. And it's just, like I said, if it's, you know, pests would be obvious, but sudden changes, um, just be aware. Um, but before I let you go, cause I've, I've, have mm-hmm. you on? I don't want to keep you forever. Um, I, you know, we'll end on a uh, maybe funny note, strange note. What is the most uh, interesting, memorable, strangest case <laughs> plant tree experience you've had? Mm. Well, I thought of one um, that uh, this is a long time ago. I, I was, um, I was one of the first arborists that got a, a tool that uses ground penetrating radar to mm. uh, not only to locate tree roots below ground, but also we were using it to try to image um, the trunk to to determine if, if the trunk was decayed and if so, how much decay there was. Um, I don't use it for that purpose anymore. In fact, oh. I'm not using it at all, but, oh. <laughs> um, but I got a job in... Um, at the Mirage Casino, um, where the head or the top of a huge palm uh, dropped um, right in the entryway and narrowly missed killing someone. Um, so they were very interested in understanding. And, and there's this disease, I think it was the Laviopsis was the disease, but there's no warning um, uh, that there was a problem inside the, the palm stem. And so we they said we want to try this this radar tool and see if we can scan trees and and determine if um you know there's a problem so uh prior to the, the tree falling so um or the the palm falling and um so i had to do this in the middle of the night um when it wasn't too busy there and they could block off the entrance and uh up in in, in a lift and actually a bucket that descended from the from the ceiling of this big atrium and, you know, running this antenna across. And unfortunately they removed the, the big head that fell off. So I couldn't scan that. That would have been golden to, <laughs> to see what that looked like. Yeah. But anyway, it was kind of interesting to scan all these trees in the middle of the night in the atrium of the yeah. mirage. Yeah. <laughs> I can't say I've, I've anyway. been in there, but you know, Vegas does everything <laughs> bigger. So I'm just picturing a really nice mirage, but yeah, those, uh, those palm trees, when even just the palm fronds fall off, it's scary. So mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Palms. Mm-hmm. I'm not a big palm fan. I shouldn't say that. So it's like, I mean, either, they so. just, yeah, they just want to kill people. So, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's it. um, well, I mean, I could, I, I could talk forever about trees and hearing, you know, your information on trees. So hopefully I could have you back and we could, you know, uh, narrow down the topic maybe, um, but mm-hmm. I think this, I, I think this helps a lot and uh, your website again, it's tree associates. Is that plural tree? Associates? Yeah. Tree dot, associates dot net. net. Okay. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's where you we have the trees that are in, uh, the Sacramento Valley, central Valley. You have pretty much all the pros, cons, all the descriptions. You have the article on irrigation. I, I saw some other interesting, 
um, information articles up there. Um, so a lot of good information. Ir mm -hmm. Yeah, the irrigation is key because I think, um, you know, you explained it great here, but, you know, if people want to review it and see a breakdown of it. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, and then just to let people know, again, remember, he doesn't go do home visits. I know, I know, <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's like mm -hmm. people now are like, what? Don't go. I did it for 25 years. <laughs> I know there, there's going to be some people who are like, uh, well, maybe I'll just talk them into it. Maybe I'll just talk. No, don't. You're going to get me in trouble. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, this I mean, I uh, this is this has helped me a lot, too. So um, I hope everyone enjoys. Okay. And until next time, everyone, happy gardening.